Charles Manson and his so-called family would become the most infamous killers of the 20th century. The victims died in the worst way. Committing a series of brutal and seemingly senseless crimes that would spell the end of the 1960s hippie dream. They were vicious. I mean, just horrible the killings. But what made Manson the man he was? He was a very powerful person. When he said jump, they jumped. How did so many young people fall under his spell? Charlie would talk about how he was Jesus and the devil all in one. And were Manson and his followers born to kill? August 8, 1969, I was a Los Angeles police officer working West Los Angeles Division, and I received a radio call at about 9 o'clock in the morning from a man down at Cielo Drive. I wasn't expecting what I saw when I got to that house. In a scene described by one investigator as reminiscent of a weird religious rite, five persons, including actress Sharon Tate, were found dead at the home of Miss Tate and her husband, screen director Roman Polyansky. Miss Tate was eight months pregnant. I was the first one in there. When I entered the house, uh, everybody was dead. The word pig written on the front door in somebody's blood. It was very gruesome. Detective Sergeant Mike McGann was assigned the case. When I arrived on the scene, there was some uh, wires that were cut over a large gate. I entered the driveway and uh, found a, a car parked about center driveway, which contained uh, Stephen Parent. 18-year-old Stephen Parent had been leaving after a visit to the property's caretaker. And I went inside, and I discovered uh, Sharon Tate and um, Jay Sebring. 26-year-old Sharon Tate had been renting the Bel Air home. Celebrity hairdresser Jay Sebring had been visiting the eight-and-a-half-month pregnant actress. Sharon was terribly stabbed, and uh, they were tied together with a rope which was tossed over a rafter in the house. I continued on through the back door. And I found uh, Abigail Folger. 25-year-old coffee heiress Abigail Folger was a house guest of the Polanskis. Abigail had been stabbed numerous times. Uh, she was very bloodied and obviously dead. And I also found Wojciech Frakowski. Folger's lover, Frakowski, was a friend of Polanski from Poland. Wojciech had also been struck with the uh, gun that they used. It was, a, it was a terrible scene. I had been working homicide for a long time, so I had seen a lot of scenes, but I don't think any quite as bad as this one. Polanski was in Europe at the time. Of course, he dashed back when he found out that his, his young pregnant wife had been murdered and held probably one of the most moving news conferences, by the way, that I've ever attended. The man was just a wreck. The house is open now. You see a lot of blood all over the place. Travel, baby clothes, and that's all. Of course, the husband can be a suspect, and so we wanted to talk to Roman, and, uh, and he agreed to take a polygraph uh, the next morning at our uh, crime lab. And I was there with the polygraph examiner, he passed with flying colors. There was no question he was not part of the homicide. Nobody knew who did it. Nobody had a clue. And Hollywood just went nuts. People were buying guard dogs and they were buying guns. Oh, I panicked. 
All these movie stars, they were hiring you know, guards and off duty police, anybody that could get to the house. I mean, it was a complete panic in the Hollywood area. And the next night, the killing continued. Businessman Lino LaBianca and his wife Rosemary were stabbed to death in their home. Again, messages were written in blood. After the Labiacas were murdered the next day, it really started hot and heavy. There was a lot of fear and paranoia here in L.A., particularly in the movie column. Why? Well, not just because the murders were incredibly gruesome, a total of 169 stab wounds, but they seemed to be random. Despite a massive police operation, investigators were unable to identify a perpetrator. We did everything we do. I mean, we, we had everybody we could possibly have, uh, think of working on the case. Doing every possible thing, every lead we had, we, we, we exhausted. Then three months after the murders, detectives got word that a young Californian girl had made an extraordinary jailhouse confession. A story so strange, it was almost unbelievable. A crazy story, uh, uh, yeah, it was very crazy. Susan was the nicest person you ever want to meet. Talking to her in, in, in that period of time, uh, you, you would think it was impossible. I mean, she was just a very nice young lady. 21-year-old Susan Atkins had claimed to cellmates that she and a group of her friends were responsible for the terrible crimes. If these were typical murderer types, or robbers, or rapists, or burglars, it would have been quite as shocking. But they started looking at the backgrounds of these people. Most of them came from good middle-class families in the suburbs. Leslie Van Houten was a uh, homecoming queen. Tex Watson was a star athlete. Patricia Kringwinkle sang the church choir. At one time, she wanted to become a nun. These seemingly all-American kids had become unrecognizable to their families. She was like a, a stranger to me. Controlled by an unlikely but powerful puppet master. This Charles Manson, this Mephistophelian guru type, who was very charismatic, very intelligent. 35-year-old ex-convict Charles Manson commanded an unerring devotion from his hippie disciples. They would kill seemingly at his whim. He did control them, and when, when he said jump, they jumped. The name Charles Manson would become synonymous with evil. But who was this diminutive guru? And how was he able to convince his young devotees to commit frenzied, bloody murder? <laughs> 